Yo, 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 it is Thread Guy. We are live in Venice, California. You already know where we are at IRL Alpha, the place to be. Link will be in the description. Look, we got a very special episode today. I am joined by a man who needs no introduction. We got Luca Nets live with us in LA. Luca, absolute pleasure. Thank you for coming on. How are you doing, man? I'm doing good. First uh, in real life interview together, so I'm pretty stoked. Uh, you pulled this off last minute, 24 hour notice. So I appreciate you. You pulled it off last minute, 24 hour notice. I mean, look, you you came to LA and you're in the middle of a hurricane. It's been nonstop raining for yeah. for three days. How's how's the LA trip been so far? Uh, LA trip is I'm I'm here for 40 hours. I'm in and out. So uh, I got here, uh, spoke at SG3, had some pretty important meetings uh, for some things that we're trying to do over at Pudgy, and wrapping it up with you. Gonna eat uh, some food after this and uh, hop on the 9 p.m. back to uh, Miami. Guys, work is different. How frequently are you like hopping on a flight? for the purpose of like a couple meetings in, in your back, like the couple day trip, the weekend trip. At least once a month, at least. Really? At least, yeah. I, I you know, I, I kind of complain about it more than I should, but I'm an introvert. And so it actually takes a lot of energy for me to do this stuff. And I like, I dread it, but you got to win. And uh, this is how you do it. That's a little surprising. Like I, I have a little introvert in me as well, but I feel like you're so like eloquently spoken, running the spaces, storytelling, running the the top-down stuff. I very much found, I'm curious your thoughts on this. I dick around and waste a lot of time in Zoom meetings. Like mm. I, I take a lot of 30-minute Zoom call. We don't get anything done. Wasted time. Just like a calendar block. When you get in person, it feels like the productivity, the energy is a little bit different. You can just make it happen. It actually moves the needle. And, and I stopped doing the Zoom meetings too. I'm like... Now people want to meet. I'm like, no, dude. Like, we how do you how it. do you approach that? I always yeah, it's like that, a that, weird that one. Is, it is it is a real it is a really weird one. What I will say is I'll just be like, I'll try to like in the most respectful way possible. Though totally on the other people on the other side of it totally think I'm rude, but <laughs> it's not me being rude. It's really me protecting my time and my energy because if I continue doing 12, 15 calls a day, I'm gonna like burn out, and that's just nobody in nobody's best interest. So I'll just always push them like, hey, we want to meet, we want to collaborate. I'll be like, okay, send me the proposal. You know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, there's nothing, to, you know, and usually when I look at the proposal, I'm like, well, thank God we didn't talk yeah. because this would have never made sense for us anyway. Or I push for like five minutes. I'll be less on my calendar and I have a five minute option on my calendar. Really? And or, or I'll tell them, I'll be like, okay, book 15 minutes or book five minutes here. And I'll tell them like what to book uh, and then I'll just make it quick. Damn. I'm set on the like go to 30 minutes. No, don't do that. Add the 15 and five minute option for sure. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. The 15, I like that. Yeah, because it's, it's just like, and tell them to book 15. Be like, look, let's book 15. If it makes sense, we can reschedule it and do 30 minutes to an hour. But a huge time saver because at the end of the day, like everybody wants to work. Everyone wants to collaborate. I want to help people. But at the end of the day, I have to help myself and help the team and help the company and the community. And, you know, I'm not going to help them by you know, spending 30 minutes to an hour, you know, taking 70% of the calls that just don't make any sense. You ever feel this like exterior pressure where it's like, yes, protect my time, protect my peace. But when I'm not on 15 calls a day, like I could be missing something. To totally. I, I think it's not necessarily, that's not really the pressure I feel. I more feel like the pressure of like a year and a half ago, I wish I had 15 calls. And, oh. you know, and, yeah. and it's like, I, I want to show people the same respect that they show us. And we are here because of not only Pudgy Penguin holders, but because of the support of the greater Web3 community. So when people from Web3 specifically like will DM me on Twitter, part of me feels bad because I feel like I have an obligation to listen because I wish people would have listened to me 18 months ago. Ooh. Right, 18 months ago, I was the loudest person in the room. Even 12 months ago, I was the loudest, six months ago, I was the loudest person in the room. So I felt like people weren't listening to what we were doing. Yeah, I respect the hustle too. Mm -hmm. I respect, it takes some balls to hit somebody up on a Absolutely, Twitter DM and, even, and be like, hey, I want to talk. I have something to propose. So I'm not trying to shoot you down because I'm, you know, because I don't care mm -hmm. uh, or I'm trying to be rude. I'm really just trying to protect my time because at least the last four months of last year, with the exception of December, I was like doing way too many calls. Mm -hmm. And at some point I have to be critically thinking, not just like talking all day. You mentioned a timeline like where you're the loudest person in the room. You didn't feel like anyone was listening. They're definitely listening now. But when did they start? You know, it sucks because I think, you know, a lot of people asked when they saw the recent stuff with the Pudgy Penguin floor price. They're like, you know, I said this on your space, but like, why is it happening? And I would say, well, why isn't it? Why didn't it happen before? <laughs> and so I think like after Walmart, 
I think people really started to listen. And then as of recently, everyone's like, great job, great job. I'm like, oh, I didn't really do anything. Just price kind of moved in this direction that I think it should have been in six months ago, but it is what it is and it is where it is now. So I think people are starting to listen now. I mean, obviously now I think I have one of the loudest voices in the space, but I believe once we did Walmart, I think it really kind of made it clear regardless of what price was, was at the time. I think it was hard to argue that after Walmart, we weren't like a serious, serious, serious group out of the lot. For sure. It kind of feels like, like I've always looked at it like price is generally like a lagging indicator. Totally. Like it's like a reflection of what you've done over the last like 18 months that have then price has now caught up to our actions, yeah. not vice versa. Like there's a lot going on pudgy related. It feels like we just, I mean, we did the space like what a week ago, two weeks ago. Yeah. And it feels like even since then, there's just shit coming from, from every angle. This week in particular, it's a good week to be a pudgy penguin. Yeah, it's a good week. To it's a good week to be a pudgy penguin for a lot of reasons. We got to talk about this offline here a little bit, but the dimension allocation is, I mean, it's wild. I believe that there is a few communities sort of like whitelisted as part of this allocation, Pudgy being one of the, the majority, if not the biggest, yep. out of the group, on top of a lot of other people just like didn't claim the airdrop. So the ones that did, it was a lot more lucrative. I mean, yeah. how did Dimension Pudgy even become a thing? So the, the Dime crews are a bunch of Pudgy Penguin holders. So it kind of comes down to, you know, we have this thing in Pudgy Penguins, and I think it's probably the strongest part about Pudgy is it's not the team it you know it's not the character it really comes down to the community and one of the things that I thought was most special about Pudgy and one of the reasons why we purchased it is because I knew it had the buy-in of a group of people that either own these things or they don't mm -hmm. and that is the hardest part about these communities is getting the right people to buy in like what is a community of people that aren't where you want to be. It's like, if I am uh, around, but let's say I'm around five losers all day, uh -huh. I'm going to be the sixth loser. Mm -hmm. Or if I'm around five millionaires, I'll probably be the sixth millionaire. Web3 mm -hmm. NFT communities embody the same ethos. If I'm around a bunch of chads, then I will probably be a chad. If I'm around a bunch of down bad, you know, mm -hmm. just down bad group that's just angry and resentful and bickering, then I'm going to be down bad, resentful and bickering. Mm -hmm. And so from Pudgy Penguin's perspective, it has what I believe to be the most affluent group of builders in the mm -hmm. space. And so, you know, you've got the Layer Zero guys, you've got the ZK Sync guys, you've got so many the projects. Nansen, Nansen. Nansen, Dimension. I mean, the list is pretty, uh, pretty big. I mean, all, I don't know an executive at a major, major crypto exchange that doesn't have it. We have the Polygon guys, we have the crypto.com crypto guys, KuCoin. So the list is pretty big in that respect. I think ultimately the advantage that you're seeing is that these people are now building protocols and products and rather than just giving it to farmers who are making, you know, you know, the, the basically the symbols of the world and are basically giving them access and allocation, that actually doesn't make too much sense. What would probably make the most sense is giving it to, you know, a community of, you know, affluent builders and traders. And so on one side of the spectrum, Pudgy Penguins is a great group of builders, but also a really great group of traders. Mm -hmm. And so the story of Pudgy Penguins, if you know it, was CT bought penguins because they missed out on apes and punks. Mm -hmm. So all the crypto, real crypto Twitter guys, not the art guys or the culture guys, which is really what like punks and apes really curated, a lot of the traders... Uh, influential traders went into Pudgy as like their NFT exposure in uh, late 2021. And they kind of have held their bags ever since. And so you have this mix of like builders and then affluent influential traders. And as you know, if you're a protocol, like what are you trying to get access to? Builders and traders, mm -hmm. right? And, and so you have this like mix where if I'm a protocol, it's almost irresponsible not to drop Pudgy's uh, an allocation because you're either going to allocate that to, you know, uh, farmers who are doing your protocol no service. And then like Dime is a perfect example. Like Brian from Layer Zero tweeted about it. Alex from tweeted about it. Bobby Ong, uh, you know, co-founder of CoinGecko tweeted about it. All Penguin PFPs now are some of the most respected and influential people building in crypto are now tweeting about your protocol. Yes. That's getting not only a ton of eyeballs on it, it's getting the right eyeballs, right? In crypto, one power user can literally make a protocol. 
And so you are tapping into a nerve of what I would refer to as power users, right? Mm -hmm. The right users. And when you're a, a protocol and you're launching, token distribution is really important. You actually want as many holders as possible. Mm -hmm. And almost every protocol that launches has a percentage of token supply that they are allocating to the general public to get that. Usually it's allocated towards like farmers, but mm -hmm. that is simply a means to an end. What, is, what does NFTs really bring above all else. I mean, they are the most tight knit communities, right? And so from our perspective, you know, we're, we're pushing the mimetic power of penguins. We're, we're making memes around the dime, the, the gift stuff. And, you know, obviously the builders are rallying behind it. The traders are rallying behind it. And all of a sudden you have this perfect recipe of a group of people who are backing protocols and not only just backing it, but putting it into the right rooms with the right people, supporting it on Twitter, galvanizing around it. And I think it's just like the perfect edge case for how protocols can bootstrap and expedite the growth of their communities in a way that I think was pretty obvious, but it wasn't obvious until it it, it happened. Until and it fucking happened. And now you're seeing it and you're like, okay, this is this is the way. Yes. There's a lot to unpack there. I very much view this specific dime x pudgy allocation as like it was a light bulb moment for me. And it was a light bulb moment for me in in many reasons. But one of the things I, I figured out is like, okay, you have a community like Pudgy Penguins. For various reasons, you would view that as like a blue chip or premier community in this space. Those are the power users you mentioned that you want access. And it's sort of this like 2021, 2022, like top down model where it's like team mints tokens, gives them to their holder base, and then you mint new tokens to your existing holders. But what this opened to me is sort of this idea of other teams and ecosystems allocating tokens directly to the holders that they want to hit. You talked a lot about the farmers and it's a good point. Like one of the reasons that the, you even set aside an allocation for farmers is you want the attention on Twitter. You want the people talking about it on Twitter. And it's like, why shoot blind darts at the board and maybe hit a couple out of a large pool when you can go just like directly to the source, hit exactly who you want to hit in one go, cut the bullshit in the middle. Do you think this is a trend we're going to see continue? And if it does, assuming it does, like it's kind of inevitable after the dimension day one success that pudgy penguins are more likely to get more allocations. And Alex, in my opinion, has pushed this narrative harder than anyone. And he's so right. It's like pudgy penguins, get your airdrop, fucking hold it. Let Dime go up and you're going to get new airdrops. Yeah. I think if you're a protocol, you have to have an allocation for the public because amount of holders is imperative to the success mm -hmm. of your protocol, right? The more holders you have, the more people you have championing the protocol, the more likely you're there to hit algorithm, the more likely you are to be trending. So name of the game, if you're launching a token, like amount of holders is like a huge indicator. People, you know, when Pepe crossed 100,000, I was like, yes, we crossed 100,000 yeah. holders. Like it, it is a huge factor to this. And so if you're a protocol, you have two choices. You can either go and, you know, target farmers, which typically, you know, it is, uh, there's definitely a sub segment of really smart, sophisticated farmers, but in general, from a mass perspective, it is typically people in like third world countries who are really trying to get like the last dollar out of it. And if things don't go according to plan, they are the loudest and most aggressive people on Twitter. Again, there's a subsegment of really elite, you know, eloquent, sophisticated farmers, but they are not the majority. And mm -hmm. I think they would tell you that. And then you on this other side, you have this group of NFT holders, pudgy penguins, whether it's, you know, other NFT projects, what NFTs do better than anything else is they create the deepest communities. And I don't think that's hard to argue. Yeah. I think I think we I think anybody who knows NFTs understands this. And so, what would you rather infiltrate? Farmers who are clearly you know farming your project with the intent of yielding the U.S. dollar value and selling it and moving on their way, or a project that has you know deep community, which eventually is really what you need if a protocol develops deep community. They ultimately win. Of course. And the reason why Pudgy Penguins is so special is like, obviously there's the builders and all of that, but like what has Pudgy Penguins shown above all else? They've really shown diamond hands, right? Like it, it, like w even in the worst of worst FUD, the lowest floor price Pudgy Penguins ever hit was 0.7 ETH. And for most, it's like a huge accomplishment. These guys and gals are built different. And I think, you know, outside of just the, 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 the prism of builders and elite traders and influence and, you know, great cosign and Twitter engagement and mimetic power, these guys are also, like you said, 
they're not going and taking their dime airdrop and market selling it. They're going and staking it and buying more. And mm -hmm. so I think that that it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. But it's fascinating because this adds, I think, to the depth of NFT use cases. Not only do you have a, a pretty picture that can go a lot further than any coin can go. Not only do you have this deeper community tie that I think just builds camaraderie and emotional attachment that I think is unparalleled to anything existing in crypto. Not only do you have this asset where you, if you have a blue chip NFT, you can pull 70% LTV on a loan frictionlessly yeah. and pay 15% APR, which I think is like one of the great, great use cases of it. Mm -hmm. You now, if you pick the right NFT, have the opportunity to get these free goods and services and in this respect, tokens and you know allocations from protocols for basically being a part of this group. It makes the argument, I thought about this earlier today and I sat there and I was like, if I knew that this was a thing, and I'm pretty upset at myself for not thinking that this was really going to be a thing. I thought, you know, Board Ape kind of set the roadmap for this, uh -huh. but Board Ape did it internally. Yes, they did it. This is this changes everything because this is external. There, this is endless upside. And as long as we continue to attract these people to the pudgy penguin, I mean, it is. It. I thought about. It, I was like, dude, I wish I, I would have bought five hundred penguins, <laughs> <laughs> like when I could have afforded it. I was like, this is. If if I even thought that this was like a real use case. But this, to me, I think will be the highest yielding use case of them all. What you just said about apes was so on point. Because they did it internally yeah. in their own ecosystem. Yes. They did it with ape coins. Yes. They did it with mutants. They did it with dogs. But this is like this is like new paradigm because it's, it's literally endless. And the thing about it, endless upside, but there really isn't any downside. Because no. it's like, cool. If you, you're a pudgy holder, you get blank, you get Y token for holding your pudge. You get an allocation set aside. And protocol rugs, it goes to zero. You lose nothing. You got to shit for free. Yeah. But... On the off case that you get a, a dime, the upside is, is is sort of endless. And in a bull market, you can only imagine how many new tokens are, are spun up and launched. When you mentioned the community originally, late 2021, was buying Pudgy Penguins, kind of as like a board ape punk cope. I still say it's the only play, NFT play CT got right, is yeah. Pudgy Penguins, the only one that they got right. And you obviously identified it pre-purchasing Pudgy Penguins. I'm curious, as you identified that community and these power users that already had pudgy how close was that demographic to how you viewed like your north star of what the pudgy penguin community would look like the influential people that would be involved etc you know you kind of have to separate the brand from like web 3 collector mm -hmm. to like web 2 brand i knew from day one who owned it. I mean, just you just have to look at the one, who owns the one of ones in Pudgy. Ooh. I mean, every person who owns the one of one at the time in 2021 was like the goat of the goat. I mean, you have GCR who owns the ghost penguin who like is the CT goat. And it's like hard to argue that. Mm -hmm. No one would argue. Vincent Van Doe, which basically was like one of the all time. The shark, NFT, right? Yeah. The all time great NFT collector. You had 9X who at the time had the craziest SOS airdrop. <sighs> And insane. all of that. You had a three IQ capital who is his own like secret hidden weapon within the sphere. Long story short, those are the guys like if you those type of people owning an NFT and being like, oh, we are a part of a community together. It's like the cool kids table in the cafeteria. It's like, why, why would I want to be a, in a, ca if I could pick, why would, if I was like, if I was at high school, I'd probably want to be with a football team. Like not to say that, you know, obviously the analogy is, is if you assume the football team is the coolest team in the cafeteria. If we're in Texas. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. If you're in Texas, you'd probably want to go sit with the football team and be with the cool kids. And that's kind of like what I think Pudgy Penguins ultimately was. And now this is just like amplified because I think we've brought so many more great people in. But it, it, it's really just like, if you're going to be a part of a community, don't you want to be in the community with the coolest people a part of it? I mean, that's like why I want to go to Soho House, right? Why do I pay Soho House? Because there's some cool things, but I really want to be around a, a good network of people. I don't know if I answered your question, but the, the edge case there, I think, is ultimately the people that are a part of your community. No, you answered it one to one. And like one of the things I look at now is, first of all, you're very right with this like cool, cool kids table. You're, you're so right. It's like, cool. I'm, I'm a, a Nansen subscriber. Right. I look and the founder is rocking a pudgy, dropping out alpha about pudgy penguin it just it sort of works one-to-one -one. but then you also look at outside of the like biggest heavy hitters that got pudgy penguins you like just like look around at the ecosystem and sort of the community empowerment and you see a thing like pudgy gaming and you're like oh shit i get this and then you see pudgy gaming and then you see every other project launch their own like gaming content vertical and it's like oh 
I, I get this. And I was reading a tweet thread the other day from, I don't know the handle, but the name is like number one penguin on Twitter with the bowl cut. <laughs> and they were, it, was, it was hilarious, by the way. Number one penguin. And, was and they were going back and forth with, with somebody about just how like the early days of Pudgy Penguins and, and how this like vision was built. And there was a question along the lines of like, did Luca show up like with the full top down roadmap ready to go? And he was like, no. Like Luca was in Discord day one, every single day, taking individual meetings with community members, sourcing ideas, getting feedback, and like figuring out what people want to build this thing. Like, how much does that early ethos do you feel like reflects as we go deeper down the line? Pudgies are twenty ETH. Pudgy gaming is popping. There's all Giphy's going crazy. Pudgy toys. Like, is that sort of ethos sprawled through and carried through, like, Pudgy Penguins as a, as a big vehicle of their success now? It's, it's everything. And, and Pudgy Penguins, without Luca and team buying it, its destiny was already preordained. What, what I did and what we will continue to do is just accelerate the legacy. But Pudgy's was on a path to be the doge of NFTs. And it probably would have been, like, underwater for a couple of years and did its thing. That group, again, do not underestimate the influence and the camaraderie of that group. That group does not care. And so again, people give me and, and the team credit and we appreciate it. Uh, and obviously I think we've done some great things. Mm -hmm. You know, when I first came into Pudgies, I was like, how do you build this like you would like you would have built Doge if Doge had a team behind it? I think this can be more of a crypto cultural icon than Doge. I totally believe that. Wow. That is it's fascinating. Just your your takes on like the Pudgy I it was preordained before I even stepped into the picture it's wild and then when you look at what you've been able to do on top it's really what, what i think you've done better than than anyone and especially in your role is tell the story and like proliferate the ip the machine and the energy the aura around it is ready you just have to put the right things in the right places so the community can flow in yeah. and make those plays and i mean that's sitting right next to me i mean we got we got walmart toy right here dropped a couple on the bottom these are the old ones too yeah. we'll talk about the new ones in a sec yeah then there you go right there we, we got to jump into that i mean quite literally at walmart it just is not to 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 glaze you here but it's got to be the biggest sort of ip moment that's happened from like an nft crypto native brand. I think it would be difficult to dispute that on on many levels. I mean, now that that we are quite a few months extended well beyond the first Walmart launch, second one we'll dive into. Like how how are we feeling about like round 1 of Walmart, how that played out? And I guess what what are some of the biggest learnings from the first rollout here? So I think to your point because you said something that I think some viewers might refute. You know, it's important to understand that because because there was a board ape T-shirt mm -hmm. that I think is actually kind of going viral right now that that's in Walmart that was actually in Walmart before us. Oh yeah, you're right. But you need to un but you need to understand the difference. There's a huge difference. There's a huge difference between putting a graphic tee in Walmart in the clothing section, which is like the most underperforming section in that store, where there's like no competitive. What where you're competing is you're competing against uh, you're competing against nothing right? You're competing. You're really competing on price yeah. versus a toy aisle where you're competing against legacy IP in the most competitive aisle in, in probably the entire chain. It, it is arguably the most competitive. So I think there's a delineation. So I agree with you, by the way, but I just wanted to make sure in case somebody was listening, like, oh man, I saw a tweet actually. You know, it's coming. Yeah. I was like, well, there's actually no comparison. I could have got a, a pudgy penguin t-shirt in Walmart and Target day one within a month of me coming into this brand. There's two different uh, yeah, approaches, yeah, yeah. and but I still respect the guy who did that because it's still not the easiest thing in the world, but there is a difference. So what did we learn? It, it was a huge success. I mean, we sold 750,000 toys in seven months, which kind of exceeded from a unit basis. I've never sold that many individual units in such a short amount of time. I've generated more revenue. So mind you, like the cost on a Pudgy Penguin toy is you know, four or five bucks. So, you know, it's not a huge revenue number. So I've obviously had more revenue in previous businesses in a shorter amount of time or in that same span of time. But the actual individual unit basis, I mean, I can only imagine that probably 100,000 unique people have bought Pudgy toys, right? Like you could assume, because obviously I know some holders swapped a bunch, but that that's not that you know many in comparison. Mm -hmm. So 100,000 unique buyers is really fascinating. But one of the alpha drops that will drop here and they'll probably announce when we kind of announce it is we're going back in more stores. So they made a reorder. So they're they're not making a reorder if we if we if we if we failed. We're going in more stores, new line, more toys. So we're expanding the partnership. And I think that signals a huge moment for this industry. 
because I think it's one thing to break through and kind of break the barrier. It's a completely different other thing to be invited back. And I think now what we did there, I think signals something that all NFT founders should be looking and paying attention to, which is the door is open. And four months ago, we cracked it open. And today we blew it open and we are going to need help keeping it open, right? Like it, it can't, it can't be, and I'm not saying this is a one man thing because I think other projects are doing great jobs, but we took a huge brand risk going at Walmart and I knew that coming in. But if you watch the, the building in public episode, I'm talking to myself, I'm like, we're either going to take this risk and we're going to really shoot ourselves in the foot, or we're going to take this risk and not shoot ourselves in the foot, but there's a real risk here, which is like we can potentially set ourselves back in a monumental way. But I knew we needed to do it because if we weren't going to do it, who was? And mass market is the most important thing. You know, NFTs are, you know, we just can't be the niche, cool and exclusive thing no. anymore. It, it, it is, there's so little upside to that. If we just want to cater to the rich and exclusive, then that sucks. That's just yeah, such no. a terrible vision in my opinion, because like we have enough of that. And so us coming back, I think is great because it's like we alleviated the risk and by the grace of God and by the grace of penguin holders and web three and the penguin, we pulled it off. And so for that, I'm stoked, but other people need to start putting it on the line like we did to really just blow this thing out. Because what's next is what's next is movies and and Netflix and Hulu, and we we really have to go there to just eliminate the taboo, hmm. right? And and I think Doodles, like you just had Doodles here, I think Doodles is doing a great job, obviously Apes, but it needs to be a unified effort. Absolutely. And and I think some of us are doing it, but I think it's time now with the momentum that Pudgy is basically gonna be in Walmart for the next, you know, guaranteed the next year. We need to take this time and, and, and start getting into meetings and being like, yeah, you should take this meeting because look at, look, you know, use this as a case study, put us in your pitch decks, put us in your presentations. It doesn't, I don't, it doesn't bother me. You have my permission on this, on this interview, but we need to break that barrier and we need to do it fast because it, it's like a, it's like an expansion and a contraction. So we're expanding right now. So we're either going to hit like optimal expansion or we're going to contract again when you know, the, the space comes back and, you know, crypto comes in and everyone's minting out the wazoo. We got to do that. We got to expand before the, the, the max minters and uh -huh. liquidity extractors come back and just becomes like a shit show all over again. Now is our time to really strike. So I'm excited that Walmart brought us back. I'm excited that for, for the space and the community for, you know, making this a success because obviously we got it through the door and we got a huge support from, from everybody who championed it. But it's really about keeping this door open forever because I think this is a big enough moment that can warrant that type of momentum. First of all, congratulations. Thanks, bro. Like, and I mean it genuinely. What you did phase one, round one Walmart was a Herculean effort. It absolutely was. We saw it on the front lines. As you mentioned, to get brought back a second time, whole different league. I think it, it, league. it means a lot for Pudgy Penguins and Pudgy Penguins holders. It means even more for the space at large and being someone that cares about crypto, that cares about NFTs, that cares about what we're doing in this space. Like it... There's no possible way to look at that and, and almost like feel proud. Yeah. Like I'm not pudgy penguin core team. I'm not massive pe pe penguin holder. I got some toys in the house, but it, like, I look at that and it's like one of my own is like putting on for the space. So genuinely like congratulations for, for everybody involved. I guess the first question is like, what is the biggest friction that is stopping other IP crypto native, NFT native brands from doing the same thing? Like, why is it 2024 and Pudgy Penguins is sort of the only physical side that's been able to break through in Walmart? Like, why haven't we seen this at scale in other communities? I think there's a couple facets. I think mass market's not easy. I don't think that's an excuse because I think people have made enough money to justify that. Some projects, IP just does, doesn't yield that. Sure. So that, but again, you can get creative. It doesn't mean you, you don't need to be in the toy aisle. You can be in the, you can do a TCG aisle, right? You know what I mean? There's like, you know, what's in the TCG aisle and what's in the toy aisle are two, two completely different things, right? You can be in other places. I think ultimately it just comes down to, and, and actually I think the most beautiful part about Pudgy Penguins going up in floor price was for the longest we were doing all of this and, and it didn't really get rewarded, at least from a price action perspective. Obviously we held when everything was kind of down only. But now that I think we're kind of leading the charge, it's inspiring others to be like, oh, if I want a high floor price, 
I got to go do real shit. Uh, and so I actually don't think people understand like the huge net positive that I think the position that Pudgy Penguins is in right now, because if they were copying us and I say copying us, it sounds like a little degrading, but I, I just mean it technically, but I, I mean it positively as well. Like when people were copying us before, they should really be copying us yeah. now. And that I think opens up a floodgate where it was like, okay, Luca's doing all this work. You know, he's got gray hair and he's 25. Like, why is he doing all this when, you know, we can just sit it out and twiddle our thumbs and just make the same money when the bull market comes back versus now it's like, okay, we are clear leaders in the space. Now let's rally behind it. So I, I'm really hoping that this next year opens that direction. And I, and I think it's also just a misalignment of priorities. I think everyone's trying to solve everything but mass adoption. And that, that just seems to me like a complete waste of time. I think the only problem that NFTs, specifically PFPs, need to be solving is mass adoption. I think all the other things that they could be solving, they're cool and sure they have value and they have use, but what really everybody needs to be doing and spending their time doing is figuring out how they can get more eyeballs. I think, I think everything else is fundamentally should be some priority, but it shouldn't be the priority. Mm -hmm. The priority in everybody's organization, and it comes down to Bored Apes did this best. I mean, I, I don't know, I, people always lose track of this. What made Bored Apes great was the unbelievable masterclass in marketing that was conducted organically or inorganically, nor do I care whether it's <laughs> organic or inorganic. And if it was inorganic, it's even more impressive to Facts. me, actually, truthfully, that that was conducted. That is what brought all the hype to the NFT space. That's what brought the top, yeah. dude, yeah. was everyone was rocking an ape. And for some reason, we all, uh, most of us lost track of that. Or I think just everyone was banking on the eyeballs that Bored Ape was bringing mm -hmm. and just saying like, it's gonna trickle down and it did. But in reality, imagine if like, all of us, like imagine if the top five or 10 NFT projects did and, and came into the mindset of like eyeballs, 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 eyeballs first, we all could do what Board 8 did times three. And so at Pudgy Penguins, like our number one objective, just so everyone's clear is eyeballs, because it, it's, you know, what you actually are seeing with Pudgy Penguins is simple. It's, it's an elementary school model that I call supply and demand. Everyone knows it, which really what you've seen with Pudgy Penguins over the last two years is an increase of awareness and demand around the IP and the character while keeping the supply the same, right? We haven't issued any new NFTs in two and a half years, or at least since I took over, which has been two years and if it was six months before that. So two and a half years, no new NFTs with increased demand and awareness. At some point, those are gonna crash against each other and create a, a moment like that. And that's kind of what you're seeing. And, and that's how you bring value to your community. That's how you bring value to your holders. That's how you bring excitement. What bring, you know, so many things, like for example, Kai Sanat, that brought so much excitement to the community and to the space. And, and what was that really? A grace of God that, you know, somebody on our team got, you know, the penguin in, in, in front of Kai Sanat. There's multiple iterations of that. It, you don't need the greatest tech or the new feature on the website. Like what you really need is more eyeballs and more people posting and talking and wearing and consuming your stuff. And that is going to drive all the excitement that you need for your NFT brand and for your community to succeed. And while you do that, just don't mince new NFTs. The new NFT thing is a death sentence, dude. And if we go deeper down this dime rabbit hole, yes. the motivation to mint new NFTs is no longer there. Also, I can't help everything you say now. I think about this Doge thesis and it's so on point. It's so on point. There's a couple of things I, I want to unpack. The first thing you said, I think it's the most important thing you've said in this, in this podcast is that pudgy penguins having the floor price catch up to the quote unquote utility and the things that have been built is the best possible signal that has happened in the NFT. No, fuck the NFT space in crypto. Because we're in this, this spiral right now where NFTs are, the market is bullish, but NFTs are generally stagnant right yeah. now. There isn't a ton happening. Almost all the attention is on the shit coins, the yeah. meme coins. And as we know, they are quite literally, it's an attention game. The spirals get, get faster and faster. The rotations get quicker and quicker. Generally kind of zero sum. And what I think it's led, even I have been a victim of this, feeling like the only way is attention and utility is bad. Utility is bad. We don't need utility. Pepe didn't need utility. Dogecoin didn't need utility. Utility is bad. Yeah. Even though inherently utility is real and utility will only proliferate. Like we, yeah. we, we inherently know that. And I didn't even consider this, but you're so right. With what you just said about Pudgy Penguins is you now look at the top 
collection on ETH and you're like, what did they do to get there? The answer, you can point to things. You can point to literal things. They got in Walmart. They did the toys. They launched Overpass. They did the licensing. And that signal subconsciously is like probably the single best thing that could happen in the NFT space. Totally agree. And I, I really, really like how, how you, you hit on that. I think it's so real. Going to the, the Walmart sort of conversation, I guess like even just starting broadly, what does round two pudgy and Walmart look like? Round two and pudgy and Walmart looks like, I think 50 or 60% more stores. So we went from 2000, I think to 3000, some change. New SKUs, so new lines, more licenses, different toys, better packaging, better toys in my opinion. And so, and it's in the toy aisle and like more of a permanent placement. So we were on a pallet that kind of gets shifted in and out within eight weeks. And so now we'll be sitting there in your toy aisle for, I think at least eight, nine months to a year. And hopefully we, we run it back again. It's incredible. And you mentioned earlier, like when you first did Pudgy Walmart, there was sort of this, like, uh, there was a brand risk. Totally. And total I remember, risk. you know, the used to be in Christie's now we're in Walmart. Yeah. Everybody remembers that yeah. tweet. There was, there was a few, you know, very vocal people on, on the other side. You can't be lucky luxury and in Walmart. The two things don't work was sort of the thesis. And it feels pretty obvious that the two things do work and, and you've showed that they work. I'm curious though, does that quote unquote brand risk, does it still exist? Do you still look at that as a, a so, potential? So the brand risk that I think was presented, because I think the whole like cheap and luxury, I thought that was just, was just a phony and terrible argument. I debunked it like 10 different ways. I think the risk was if we would have launched in Walmart and not be brought back, that would have been a huge red flag. It, you know what I mean? Like I, we launched big yeah. bajillions of impression. I mean, I think that thing was probably the most impressioned announcement of NFT Web3 of the year last year, you know, from just an impression standpoint. If we would have got in there and not been able to come back, it would have been pretty embarrassing. And, and I wouldn't really have anything to have said. I would have, I would have probably just sat there and been like, dude, we, we failed. But like, that doesn't mean like the company fails, you know, and, and you know, uh, Pudgy Penguins did not live or die by any vertical, just to be clear. Uh, preordained. Yeah, we're preordained. If anything, we probably would have added more lore and they would have, <laughs> they would have memed it and made something funny about it. <laughs> but the fact that we're back, it's like, we're back, dude. I'm still thinking about like, if, if there's a, you know, we're starting to talk about like a, a third order, we'll, we'll talk about that in a couple months. I don't know if I'll do a third order. I don't know, because what I wanted to do, we did. Mm -hmm. Right. Like what I wanted to do was I wanted to break the barrier and I wanted to come back. Right. There's there's a lot of different variables of there. So, right. Like I, I love what I'm seeing at Hot Topic. Like obviously there's certain placements and where I want to be. I, I want to push and pull. I don't want, you know, physical, just like I said, minting is like a death sentence. You know, minting can be good. Just so just to be clear, minting could be good if demand is clearly overflowing mm -hmm. for your product. Only one person's been able to pull off a good secondary mint, which was mutants. It's the only one who actually really pulled it off. Everyone else kind of failed. And kind of just because it was first. Yes. Yeah, I, exactly. And I think what I was worried about is done. Like I, I, I like I because do I think there's a negative association being on Walmart? No, I don't. I think with a with a taboo niche industry like Web three and NFTs, we need as many people on Walmart as possible. Yeah. We need as many people on nine nine. You get get wherever you can where regular people are, and it is a huge net positive. You can be the nine nine cent store for all I give a shit. Seriously. So I think that same risk that I was worried about is not there. Will we do a third one? I I don't know. We'll, we'll explore that in a couple months. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to show people it was possible. Mm -hmm. And I and we did that. And and that like, not only was it possible, but we can succeed. And so we hit the threshold of, of what we needed to do. And 99% of the brand risk that I was worried about has been eliminated. I had a point earlier, I lost it. I just found it. Mm -hmm. And you, like a, a couple minutes ago, you were talking about board Apes their mass market attention, what they did, and, and how like Bored Apes was literally the top. Like they are the one that got apes into the eyeballs of everyone. Yep. I'm curious though, because I'm an attention ma maxi as well. Yeah. Is there at all a negative side of this where like Bored Apes forced the IP down everybody's throat, organic, inorganic, doesn't matter. It happened. Every celebrity, Jimmy Fallon, Steph Curry, it was everywhere. You could not run from it. You couldn't get away from it. A lot of regular consumers that know nothing about NFTs, their first interaction is these super expensive monkey pictures they don't understand, sort of being forced down their throat. And coincidentally, market downturns, price gets wrecked. All the headlines switch from celebrities with PFPs to how much the celebrities lost, how much Justin Bieber is down on his PFP. And it's almost like your first touch point is very negative like is there at all a spin in in that direction where it could actually be like add friction to future onboarding for the space or do you see the eyeball attention as a net positive no because the, the price could turn around tomorrow and then the headline would just shift and then the craze would be back on 
I think what I learned from Board Ape was that proliferation is everything. Now, how you proliferate is two different mediums. Mm -hmm. And so we chose the proliferation of like mimetic content. It, you know, I control my proliferation where, again, I, I don't know what happened, how Board Ape did what they did. It was so insane and so beautifully done from as a master marketer. So I think I, I think of myself as. I like so I, I am in awe to what they did. The way that we're doing it, I think, is different, but with the same principle in mind, which is get the penguin everywhere. But they got the penguin th everywhere through one way. I want to get the penguin ev everywhere through another way. I think the the way that we're doing it is a little bit more of our control. Like mm -hmm. I can't control who changes their PFP, yes. or I can, but like you know, I, I, I just don't know what that look. I don't know what that deal looks like. If that's even a deal, or it, or you know, somebody can change their PFP and then switch it a week later just because they like the marketing of changing the PFP is too rough because like it can signal positive or negative things without you with that like without even there being that much to it. Yes. Right. Somebody will just make something of it. Like oh, this person changed their PFP. They must think it's bad. Well, no, they just want to change their profile. It can be spun too here. many ways. It can be spun way too many ways. So for us, it's just like I didn't have the connection. I, again, I don't know. Again, I don't, I don't know if it was inorganic or organic. I just don't know. Yeah. So if it was inorganic, I don't have the connections to do it. And if it was organic, we don't have the momentum to do it, mm -hmm. right? So either way, it kind of came down to us having to do it a different way. And I think the way that we're doing it is arguably a little more sustainable, mm -hmm. a little less eyeballs, but a little more sustainable. You know what's funny is they slapped on the Giphy and the Instagram and the TikTok. Yeah. Like as you're talking about attention, mass media, get the IP in front of everybody, worry about the NFT side of it on, on the back end. They slept on the, the content. People slept on the content. I did not feel like it, it, it get enough, got enough credit. And now we look at, like every day someone will post like, Pudgy Penguin Giphy views to like Mickey Mouse or like Charles Pokemon or like some other like mass IP. And it's like, yo, this is fucking insane. Yeah, the, the Giphy is like at 16, 17 billion views now. It, it, I, I didn't really take it too seriously in the beginning because Giphy doesn't translate to like sales. Of course. So like I'm very conversion oriented, but like I then go to Asia and I see Line and Cacao and, and Line, for example, Line's whole character suite, which is Line's a multi-billion dollar business, literally was conceptualized off of stickers and gifts. Like these things really have a backbone in culture and over time were really sticking to people's head and are a great follow-up touch point. Meaning like I see a headline, Pudgy Penguins this, and then you get hit with the gif. It is like the ultimate follow-up touch point. I've actually never seen anything like it, but we have a real machine I and mean, we have like eight, nine people on our Giphy team cranking out like, you know, two, 300 gifts a, a week. Oh, it's like that. Yeah, it's like that. I mean, we're, we're uploading 1,000, 1,500 gifts a month. <sighs> yeah, yeah, I'm just, we have a real, we built like a whole tech stack. We have like a whole app that we built for it in-house that like helps us expedite the flow. Yeah, no, the, GIF, the Giphy is the real deal and, and I think is one of the most slept on platforms out there for sure. That's wild. It's sort of a little off topic, but I, I was listening to some of your building and public stuff. Where does Pudgy Penguins like rank on the most difficult like business ventures? The most difficult for sure, dude. This stuff is not even close because the IP business is incredibly hard. I mean, I would never, and then you add like the publicly traded IP business side of it. It, it is so hard. I mean, it is so, it is so difficult. But also the person that I am today versus I was two years ago, I'm a completely different man. Um, emotion, like from my business acumen to like my emotional aptitude to everything about me is different. I don't even know how to say that because, you know, you can go through a year and you can make a difference in like two years. And, but usually like people will think like, oh, you gotta, it's gotta be like five, six years before a person Large changes. Job. Dude, I am a completely different human being to who I was two years ago. I talked to Lorenzo about this. I was like, dude, I can't even recognize who I was two years ago compared to who I am now because it forces you to learn and mature. You got to understand, I, I grew up a hooligan, like a real hooligan, dude. And I had no guidance. I had no father figure. I had, and, and this forced me to grow up in a way that is uncomparable to anything that I've done because I had so much on the line. We had millions of dollars on the line. We had our reputations on the line. We had our communities like hard earned bets on the line, right? Like I don't take that lightly. Like these people really believing in us. And it was either you were going to change and change really freaking fast or you were going to fail 
and not only lose all of the, I've got to understand Pudgy Penguin's failing. It's not just us losing money. It's not just like our reputation to like partners and peers and colleagues. It also probably would have led to a group turning on us, which was like the whole, like think about the, think about the risk that was really incurred when buying this business. I mean, I could have really done so much, da- like so much damage could have been done if we really screwed this thing up. Like if I didn't do the one week discord call and I didn't actually align and I did it my way and I treated this like a dictatorship and this was my company and you guys should be lucky I took it over. I mean, if I came in with that mindset, dude, especially the penguins, because the penguins don't tolerate shit, dude. No, they don't Man, fuck around. They don't, they, they don't tolerate shit. They, they, they. <laughs> I mean, they do not tolerate shit, dude. Like if I ever were to pull some funny shit, they would, <laughs> they, they, they would rip me apart, you know? And so I just had to really grow up so, so much faster than I ever have it before in my life. And, and I, for that, I'm thankful. And so I'm thankful for the challenge. And I don't say that like, oh my God, like this thing is so hard. Like I say it like, man, I wake up every day with a purpose because it's like, I got to get better. I've got, you know, I've become a better leader, a better friend, a, a better human. You know what I mean? Like just, it just, I bear the responsibility of, of these people who hold the NFTs on my shoulders. It might not be the right way to approach mm-hmm. it, but it is the way in which I approach it. Like their future is my future. My future is theirs. Like there's no other way. I can't win without them winning. And I will lose, if I lose, they lose with me. You are the penguins and the penguins are you. Yeah, it's exactly. It's like, I lose, they can still win. They still will win. But like, it's a big bump in the road that I don't want to issue. Preordained, but we'd rather do it together. Yeah, exactly. This, this is a personal. I like that. Yeah, we're going to stick with that one. <laughs> this is a personal one for me. I also heard you talking about it, like on the building in public. And, and you, you're like, you're, I'm a very emotional person. I have very strong emotions. Yeah. I do as well. And you said it, I say it about myself. My biggest strength, my biggest weakness yep. is how much I care, how obsessive I am, how, how invested I get into things. It's also the biggest downturn, right? As high as it, it goes up, it goes that much lower on, on the downturn. What was that like personal maturity, like journey, like I guess for you on the EQ, like managing your emotions when it's no longer, like it isn't just Luke and Nets you have to worry about. It's like, it's core team, it's extended team, it's moderators, it's 10,000 holders. It's, it's every other, it's the, I mean, fuck. You want to put this much on your your shoulders? The fate of NFTs at large. There's a lot sort of reliant on on the Luca Nets vessel, no longer just yourself. Yeah, there's there's so much to this history of this company that people don't know about. There was a moment where I almost imploded this whole thing, and what I mean by that is I won't go into too much detail. Somebody like really screwed us within the company. We figured it out. We moved on. That, however. And it was like a real betrayal, like an all time great betrayal and whatever. We figured that out. That really put me on the rocks because like I had never been. No one had ever screwed me like how I got screwed probably a year ago. Got really got really beat down. Then we raised money, which was great. And then we started hiring talent and my emotional spectrum was like not tapered from all of this betrayal. And so we hired Austin. Austin was the first real hire outside of the core group who purchased it, paid him, you know, first real salary somebody was getting paid. And he comes to me after like three weeks and he says, Luca, if you keep this up, I'm leaving. And I'm like, what do you mean? And like that hit me like a brick wall because I had never felt like I was ever the problem. But we had gotten so beaten down and things were so tough and there was so much external forces of just so much pressure from like upcoming toy line to socials to having absolutely no cash and needing to bankroll this to people like worked for free for a year and they're like i can't keep working for free so like you're gonna pay me or i'm gonna leave and it's like we were barely getting the job done before what do you mean you're gonna leave like we're all screwed if you leave and that's like when i hired an executive coach and things like that and i just realized that i had a problem that i needed to fix and that we were going to build this business as a unit and to build enterprise value it needs to be a group of people that are not dependent on any like single vocal points and like you said, like give some people some background on my emotions. I'm either super passionate, I'm super happy, I'm super thankful, I'm super grateful, I'm super you know religious, and then I'm super angry, and then like you know like I I I it's my greatest I'm a Gemini, so it's my greatest weakness and my greatest strength. But I just can't I used, for my whole life I used to be like I'm a Gemini, that's just how I am, <laughs> right? But like that's that's just not how actually that can work. Uh, that that that's not conscious living. So I just I just sat in my truth. 
I sat there and I realized I was not the leader that I needed to be. I was a good forward facing leader, but I was not a good internal leader. Mm -hmm. I took the right, you know, personal classes from like therapy and got a yogi and like just really getting my consciousness figured out and then a professional coach and then and then just trusting the group and then just, you know, talking amongst one another, not just being in my little shell. I'm the best version of myself that I've ever been as an entrepreneur. I know that not because I think that, but because the people around me are telling me that like Lorenzo's never, never one to like, Lorenzo, you know, Peter tells me exactly how it is. Lorenzo tells me exactly how it is. Vedant tells me exactly how it is. Like I have like Lorenzo hitting me up being like, dude, you're really evolving and I can feel it. I, I don't, I don't lash out the way that I, I do. You know, this year we're very like performance driven. So I'm kind of kicking up like the meet your KPIs or you're out of here type of cadence. But that's just like, that's just like, it's go time, of course. you know, but that's just not me like freaking out on people for uh -huh. no reason, you know? And at least you can justify a, totally. a mini freak out. Exactly. We got KPIs, dude. How, how do, I'm curious, how does like the personal uh, executive coach come into play? Oh, dude, she was everything. Austin referred her yeah. to us. Okay, word. So, so he was really serious. Yeah, yeah. And, and and honestly, Austin would have left if I, so basically I blew up on Austin and then I apologized to him. And then he scheduled a call with me and he said, if you didn't apologize I was going to leave and if you keep this up you know because it's also I used to be like so obsessed with the floor price too like dude if floor price is oh, down 10 be a brutal one. it was so brutal dude it was because it was like we know everyone is is judging us by that and our success no matter how much I sc scream to the back of the bleachers and no matter how many views I hit or whatever like none of that matters if price, or at least so I thought, if price didn't follow. Now I know just to trust the process and like it will, greatness can only be denied for so long. That's something I've been telling myself for two years. That's such a bar though. Yeah, it's, it's what Donda told Kanye. Donda's Kanye's mom in the Genius interview, or in the Genius documentary, she was like, you only be great for so long, they keep denying you. That's really how I felt at Pudgy. And even now I'm like, dude, we got so much more ways to go, but the space will eventually pay attention as long as you keep being great. The executive coach was great. Running a business is a science. I had ran and companies and I had been an entrepreneur off of instinct and intuition, but there's actually a methodical science to being an entrepreneur. For example, here's a really fascinating one for the for all the entrepreneurs listening to this. We did an anagram on all the executives in the company. And so you can basically tell people by their personality type, right? I'm an architect. I'm like an INTJ or something. I know everybody's sign. And so for example, we'll use a guy named Bob on the executive team. Bob doesn't exist, but I'll give you an example. Bob is uh, super ego driven. Bob is like really, you know, really values the work that he puts in. You know, when you, when you address Bob, you cannot tell Bob he did a bad job because telling Bob he did a bad job because he's so ego driven is actually going to cause him to shut down versus you talking and sitting down with Bob for 30 minutes, talking with him and, and having him tell you that, that he did a bad job, mm. right? Like we're almost, almost coming to that conclusion together versus you sitting him down and being like, you fucking suck. This uh. sucks. Right. And so one is one causes somebody to shut down, which probably them, you know, loses two to three days of productivity because they're checked out and they're probably pissed and they're like, I don't want to do anything, you know, or they work sluggishly or, or not as enthusiastically versus one takes a little more effort, or a little more time, but gets to the problem and he gets to a quicker solution and doesn't have any like backdrops. That's like an, an example of a science of, of some of the sciences that comes to running a company. And, and obviously there's like a lot more, there's a hundred different examples that I could give you of something similar, but one that I think is like really impactful you are only as good as your team. Your team is everything. I mean, this this whole company, you know, if Peter's not doing what he's doing, Lorenzo's not doing what he's doing, Vedant, Jennifer, I mean, any of any of those, you know, drop off, the company is, now we're working on making sure that if they were to ever drop off, that there's somebody to replace them. So that's like our next step in this year. Oh, interesting. Yeah. it's So enterprise value, right? So enterprise yeah. value is basically the idea that, you know, when somebody buys your business, you know, if I, if somebody bought Pudgy Penguins right now, it wouldn't have that much enterprise value. It'd probably crumble if all the executives left, mm -hmm. right? There actually is not much enterprise value there because if Luca, Peter, Lorenzo, Vedant, and Jennifer leave, got the community, you've got the IP, but we're, we're the main driving forces behind the business, not the community or the provenance yeah. of the NFT, but just the business itself. And so as an entrepreneur, what you really want to optimize for is creating enterprise value. Something where if Luca does, you know, if something, God forbid, something happens to me, the business doesn't fail. Right. Or if something happens to Lorenzo or Peter or Vedan or Jennifer, the business doesn't fail. And so this is what we're working on is like, how do you actually create real enterprise value? Because it also comes down to, you know, I took my first vacation four weeks ago. Where'd you go? 
Sedona. How was it? It was great. But like, I didn't take a vacation before uh -huh. because, you know, Lorenzo then kind of was filled in my gap as like, you know, I, you know, I got Lorenzo. So Lorenzo, you know, he, he run, he knows the business better than anybody. Truthfully, he probably knows the business better than me. So Lorenzo had gotten to the point where I can take a vacation, but I didn't take a vacation in two years. Right. I hadn't, I hadn't literally outside of traveling for work. I actually hadn't took in a break and like decompressed. And so, you know, eventually to like avoid burnout and actually create something where we can actually work here for 15 years, we've all yeah. got to be able to take a vacation once or twice a year and not have the business stop when yeah, of one course. of us leaves. So we're really working to build up the people under us to try to, you know, fill in those gaps. Uh, you know, specifically, I already have Lorenzo. And so Lorenzo's trying to find the people under him, Peter, Vinan, the rest of the group. What it sounds like is over the last two years, you maturing doesn't just mean like Luca Nets personally is in a better spot, but like the internals of the company are sort of it, elevated by many magnitudes that it just wasn't at before. Oh, we were miserable for the longest, dude. We were just miserable, slaving away, at, like just trying to do this for the group. We, we, you know, one thing about us is like we, we really like have a lot of respect and empathy for our holders, dude. Like when we get tired or when we get broken down or it feels like we're chewing glass. I think chewing glass was a great analogy for like, it really felt like we were chewing glass for a long time. It was, it was what we knew we could do for them that kind of kept us going forward and the responsibility that we think we have for them, which is strange because it's like, it's so crazy for us. Like I think about it when I see some of these guys doing what they do to like their communities, I'm like, we've been working at this for pretty much for free for the last two years. It's like, how could you guys do some of these things? things that are like so huge net negatives. It's like strange. I'm like, do you not feel the same type of respect that I feel for these people? It's it's, it's fascinating to watch. So it, it, it was it was really hard. And, and now now it's starting to get a lot of fun. It's starting to get a, a lot better. It has to, right? Yeah. Like the yeah. energy is shifted. Walmart's yeah. happy. You're sort of in just a, a, at another level than where yeah. it was. It's almost like you you pass a checkpoint in the game. Right? Yeah, we totally pass a checkpoint. You pass a checkpoint game. and you kept dying. You kept dying, kept dying. Finally, you get to the checkpoint. It's like now when you die, the fallback isn't as bad. It's a great analogy. You hit that on yeah, a checkpoint. We, we passed the worst freaking checkpoint. There we fucking go. I mean, you all are in a crazy spot. Like we we fucking covered a lot. Walmart round two is is coming back. There's a lot on the horizon. Dimension has opened my just mind frame mindset to a whole whole slew of of what is possible. I guess like before we wrap here, like where are you at? What are you most excited about with with what's coming and, and pudgy? Anything you didn't hit on? We we kind of want to talk about jump into to real quick. Like where where is this thing going? The toys has has imagined itself. It's realized itself. Pudgy World, which we, we didn't speak about a ton, is is so much further along than it was this time a year ago, 18 months ago, before it even existed. Like, where where are we at now? I just, you know, key KPI in the business this year is just like, it just, world domination. Just how many- World domination. How, first year was setting the foundation. Second year was figuring it out. Third year is scale. Like, I really want to scale. Now, I wanted it to be like a snap of a finger. So I thought coming in January, I was like, I did, I did the company stand up. I said, scale, let's just, let's just put the fuel to all this. So it's a little bit harder than I initially thought. We're, we're seeing a little bit of roadblocks, but we're knocking those down. You know, after this year, I think we'll be in an NFT bull market, right? So this year is really the year of just making it so undeniable. Now, now, now is the year that you might have an emotional attachment to something or whatever, but like, at the end of this year, everyone in the space is like, yeah, it's these guys. And I get it. I don't have one, but it's all right. But it's these guys. You know, I just I need I need to make the greatness irrefutable, undeniable, unparalleled. And and that means a lot of things. Uh, there's a lot of things in the pipeline, but that's ultimately the goal. I mean it so wholeheartedly, Luca Nets, you make me proud to say I like NFTs. Thank you all so much for listening. Thank you all so much for pulling up. I'm rugging this thing. Luca Nets, IRL Alpha. I don't have anything else more to say. Appreciate you all. Appreciate you, bro. Wow. You're fucking sweet. Yeah, appreciate you. Wow.